Audio Book Masters Listen to your imagination The beautiful and gentle springbok It is said that many years ago during the magic time of Imbambanjani when the rocks were so soft they could be shaped as a potter shapes moist clay the great god of light Umvelingani the son of Unkulunkulu looked down on the people on earth from the summit of the great Kuteni mountains in the west of the land of the Zulus the sun god saw how greatly humanity suffered on earth at that time humans lived like wild animals in the tops of trees in caves and in holes in the ground they had no laws or medicines and they had no knowledge of melting metal or building huts they led a savage existence in which every person was a law unto him or herself parents sometimes ate their own children and spouses killed each other for food or sometimes simply for pleasure they did not know anything about bathing and keeping themselves clean people ran around naked like baboons because they did not know how to tan animal skins and use them as clothes to keep them warm during winter and to hide their modesty during summer the sun god being a compassionate god decided to go down to earth and to help human beings by bringing them laws knowledge and light He made his intention known to his mother Nomkubulwane the great earth mother who told her son to leave the human race alone She told him that human beings were the most dangerous and ungrateful creatures on the face of the earth and that he should forget about trying to help them But the sun god quarreled with his mother and defiantly left the golden village When the sun god first appeared among the human beings in the full blaze of his godly glory they stood up and ran for their lives he shone like the sun his countenance was brighter than the moon and faced with such beauty the human beings reacted typically by running away one day the sun god close to despair was walking through the bush when he came across a young man dying alone in the forest the young man had been attacked by a warthog which had torn his right thigh open with one of its tusks he was bleeding to death the sun god allowed the young man's soul to leave his body immediately the god of light entered the body and healed the terrible injury he stood up and walked although he had a noticeable limp the young man's family and friends were amazed to see him alive for they had seen the war talk go him they gathered around him when he called them and he began teaching things that at first filled them with deep puzzlement then with annoyance and finally with great amazement We are told that the first thing the sun god showed the people was the secret of making fire. He asked them to gather a pile of twigs and small logs and arrange them in a pile near the entrance of the cave in which they lived. Then he rubbed two sticks together until there was a puff of smoke and little flames danced in the pile of grass packed close to the logs. To the people's horror fire erupted from the grass and climbed onto the logs and twigs very soon the first campfire was seen on earth dancing and crackling and sending a great pillar of smoke skywards again the people reacted to the spectacle by running away leaving the sun god alone at the fire however one woman found the courage to return 
carrying her child on her back. She sat next to the sun god and was warmed by the great fire he had lit. Gradually, other people came back to the entrance of the cave and they were soon sitting in a circle around the fire looking at the crippled young man with amazement and admiration. It was around this fire that the sun god began teaching the people many useful things. He taught the man how to make spears with bits of stone and shards of splintered animal bone. Attached to long shafts, these were followed by maces with stone heads and bows and arrows. The band of people began building huts of mud and grass, creating the first village on earth, and left the caves which had been their homes for generations. Other groups and families came out of the bush to learn from the sun god. One man wanted to know how to cross a river and the sun god taught him how to make a dugout canoe. He also taught the people how to catch fish in the streams, the lakes and the rivers. He also taught them simple laws to live by, and most importantly, he taught them about the gods who lived in the unseen world. Within a few years, human beings became a lovely race of intelligent creatures with laws, proper homes, chiefs, elders and healers. The sun god also taught them how to dance and sing. He showed the women which herbs were edible, which were medical and which were poisonous. He taught a group of men how to melt copper, iron and tin and how to create bronze by mixing copper and tin. He taught them how to make tongs, hammers, plows. But as the years went by, disturbing things began to reveal themselves to the sun god. Some of the people who had been taught were misusing the knowledge he had given them. He had taught them how to make harpoons to catch fish in the river, but they turned the harpoons on each other. He had taught people how to capture wild goats in the forest, show them love and keep them in special pens. But he also saw that some people stole other people's goats. He had taught people how to keep cattle, but some had turned into cattle thieves. One day, the sun god was heartbroken by a particularly ugly act committed by a group of people. He told his followers that the time had come for him to leave and return to the land of the gods. No! cried the people. We cannot allow you to return to the land of the gods. If you leave us now, your knowledge will live with you. You do not understand, said the sun god to the people. The knowledge that I have brought is forever enshrined in your minds. It will never leave, in fact, like a beautiful tree. It will grow through the generations. I am tired and I must return to my mother and my father. Some people decided to murder the young sun god, cut up his body and eat it, in the belief that by eating him they would become as great as and as strong and as knowledgeable as he was. They tied the sun god to a tree and murdered him using nine spears. They cut up his body and ate it. But instead of becoming great and wise, the stupid people became mad. They shouted at the tops of their voices for no reason. 
They danced and capered and spoke what they thought were words of great wisdom, when in fact the words they uttered were nonsense. As they danced and screeched, they developed funny little faces and their bodies became covered with fur. They turned into monkeys. They had eaten the flesh of the sun god, but they found that his bones could not be broken or cracked because they were made of gold. In their madness, they ran hither and thither through the bush, scattering the bones in all directions. After this terrible deed, the sun died in the sky, the moon passed away, and the darkness fell upon the earth. A darkness which was to last for many generations. We are told that the land turned into ice, the rivers froze, and the trees became white ghosts, forever frozen. In a lonely cave on the slope of a mountain, a little springbok prayed to the great gods not to destroy the earth because of the sinfulness of a few human beings. The springbok crouched in the cave, praying and chanting and singing for many months, and at long last the gods heard the prayers. The earth mother came down from the sacred mountain bringing with her a glow of warmth that warmed the forests and the mountains, the rivers and the valleys. She called out to the animals in the bush and told them to go into the frozen forest and find her son's bones. The animals did as the goddess commanded and brought the bones to a particular rock. The bones of the sun god were placed on the rock with a heap of firewood. The earth mother led a pile of wood with one of her fingernails, and the bones started to melt in the great blaze. The earth mother floated in the air above the fire, and the smoke entered her womb. With the help of lions, baboons and hyenas, the great earth mother, in great pain, gave birth to the sun god once more. When the warmth had returned to the world, when the sun had been rekindled and the moon had been reborn, the earth mother rewarded the little springbok, saying, from now on, you, Springbok, will be known as the animal of light, faith and reliability. You, Springbok, are going to be called Inzeepe, the shining tassel. Others will call you Tsede, which means the faithful one, the reliable one. To this day, Zulu people call the springbok Inzaepe because of the fringe of hair near the springbok's rump which gives the animal a strange glowing appearance as it leaps in front of the sun. Botswanas and other Sotho speaking people call the springbok Tsepe which means the one who is reliable, the trustworthy one. This word has given birth to another word in the Sotho and Tswana languages, Tsepo, which means hope or faith, and Tsepecha, which means to be trustworthy, to be unshakably faithful. There is a belief long held by many black tribes in Zambia, Angola, Namibia and Botswana, that on the day the last springbok dies, the world will end. With the death of the springbok, the sun and the moon will die in the land of the shadows. For this reason, 
the springbok is held in great esteem and people rejoiced whenever a springbok migration passed through their land. Although these little animals of great beauty devastated cornfields, crushing the growing corn with their sharp hooves, the people did not grieve or rage, for they knew that the following year they would be good harvests. As the springboks migrated across the land, they left behind heaps of dung. The dung decomposed, filling every nook and cranny, and when the rains came, the land was fertile, beautiful and green. It was believed that all migrating animals were the blood in the arteries of the Earth Mother, for they only followed certain roots and this is where the trees grew tallest and the grass the greenest. Audio Boatmasters, listen to your imagination.